break with reality. Now it might take you like three to four weeks and you maybe only get back to like 92%. These numbers are just guesstimates, but in general we know that they're starting to lose functioning. And then they stop taking their medicine again and they have a third break. And now it might take them up to eight weeks to get back to normal and they only get like 85% of their baseline functioning. What really happens in people with schizophrenia is they get to the point where they lose 40 to 30% of their functioning. I mean, they can only get to about 30 or 40% of what they were like before they start, had their first psychotic break and they will never get back. So it's kind of tragic because we know that this could be, a, this person, if they got, you got them on that first break and they took medicines like that, they could have a normal life if they stayed on their medicines. Um, and so this is one case where, because this is a brain disorder, you have to take medicine. There's some very interesting um, literature going on as well about what if we were able to identify someone who has schizophrenia before they have their first break and put them on medicine. So this is a very interesting concept because if you've been in, if you've worked in this field for a period of time, all of us sort of start to develop these kind of gut feelings about patients. Some of the times we see an individual, they've got some social isolation, they don't relate well to other people, and we kind of think to ourselves, is this person going to be schizophrenic? And there's some, there's been proposed, there's been a proposal that if you were to start that person who was pre-schizophrenic on an antipsychotic agent, they may never develop schizophrenia. It's possible, of course, no one's going to do that type of research because, <laughs> um, well, actually, there was a physician in Australia that decided he, he believed that he was very good at identifying these young men who were pre schizophrenic. And he believed that the treatment for them should be anti inflammatories. He put them, he put these young men, he gathered up, he decided these young men are going to be schizophrenic. I'm going to put them all on like high doses of omega 3s for anti inflammatory benefit in the brain. And at the end of his study, I can't remember, somewhere between 30 and 40% reduction in manifestation of psychotic symptoms in the ones on omega-3s. And we go, whoa, that looks pretty impressive, but wait a minute. He made the diagnosis that they were pre-schizophrenic. Maybe he got it wrong 30%. So imagine, you know, telling somebody, I think you're good schizophrenia, lifelong brain disease that you're going to subsequently probably die of, and uh, they don't really have it. So there's no, I, I'm not even sure how he did that study, but um, you can't do that. But it is kind of remarkable to think about the concept that perhaps if you could somehow identify, if you could identify that specific gene that causes this problem in the brain, and you could start early intervention with like anti-inflammatories or antipsychotics that may, ne may never develop schizophrenia. So it's an interesting concept, but a difficult one. By the way, these patients are notorious for not taking their medicines. And that's where the problem, where the problem lies. And some, some people, some researchers believe that the reason why it gets harder and harder to treat them is because the disease is progressing. But in addition, they're developing resistance to the effects of the medication. And we're going to talk about it over and over again here today. But Okay, so psychosis, schizophrenia, 100% biological. 100% you must take medicine. And people say, well, does that mean you don't have to do cognitive behavior therapy? Well, someone's psychotic, you can't, they're not going to respond to cognitive behavior therapy. However, if they have schizophrenia, they've got problems in their life. So after they're stabilized, they probably do need talk therapy to help deal with the problems that they've established in their life and not being able to relate and so forth. So I'm not, I'm not saying that you can't do other things with these people, but they absolutely have to take medicine. Bipolar illness um, has to do something with overactivation of do dopamine and norepinephrine and underactivation of serotonin. And of course, you guys all know what I mean by bipolar, right? There, and uh, bipolar means there's two, two phases of this disease. One is an elevated uh, mood state. Sometimes we refer to it as mania. And then after a period of time, that person moves into a dysphoric or depressed state. And so they go from extreme elevation to extreme dysphoria. And then th there's another type of bipolar dis... By the way, we call that type 1 now. And we used to refer to that as manic depression. And, um, but there's another type that we call type 2. That if you're watching the television... Um, it's referred to as bipolar depression. 
These people are a little bit different because um, these people don't get manic, but they have a normal mood state, like an ethymic mood state, like where I'm at right now. And that, that happens for a period of time and then subsequently get very depressed. Where, where the, the commonality here is that there's two phases. One where you have either elevated or manic state followed by a, dep a depressed state and it's cyclic in nature. And this one you just have a normal mood state that's followed by a depressive state and it's cyclic in nature. By the way, we used to always miss these diagnoses. And the reason why we would miss them is because um, you, those people never went to their doctor when they were feeling good. They only went to their doctor when they had a depressed state. So the doctor sees them for a moment in time and says, oh, you're depressed, so you have a depression, major depression. Therefore, I'm going to give you medicine that improves norepinephrine and serotonin. And the interesting thing is, if you give a person this type 2 medicines that improve norepinephrine and serotonin, you could make them bump them into a manic or hypomanic state. Is that, I don't know how many bipolar patients have told me, I, yeah, I never knew I was bipolar until I took that antidepressant and all of a sudden I got manic, right? So we used to miss those a lot. We're a lot better at not missing them now. And here's the reality. The reality is that this is a spectrum disorder. Nobody refers to these other problems as spectrum disorders, but they probably all are. But we know this from the literature, it's spectrum. So people exist somewhere along the spectrum like this. Sometimes people right here, you can't even tell um, that, you know, I mean, you're not sure are they type 1 or are they type 2. But people are at different levels. And some, these ones are usually very noticeable. Remember Margot Kidder? She played Lois Lane. She had the classic manic depression. And she, when she would stop taking her medicine, she would get manic. And they'd find her wandering the streets of Seattle, delusional and psychotic. So it's pretty easy to identify those type 1s. Difficult to identify these. And sometimes these in between here get confusing. Now, how much of this problem do you think is uh, organic or biological in nature? 50-50. Maybe um, 85 to 95%. We're really not sure. There's lots of different literature out there. Probably these ones are more like this, and these ones are more like this. And, and so we're not sure exactly how much of these are, are, are exactly, you know, like 95% organic. But this is a type of a, a problem where you have to take medicine as well. And um, usually what you have to do, in, is like, and this is the way we used to think, is that you couldn't, these people need to treat their depression and their activated or elevated mood state, right? But you can't just start them on an antidepressant. You have to get them on a mood stabilizer first before you start them on an antidepressant so that you don't bump them into a manic episode. As a matter of fact, there's an interesting thing here because you guys have all heard about these medicines, right? Abilify, um, uh, Latuda, Vralar. These medicines are, they've, they're commonly referred to as second generation antipsychotics, but in reality they're third generation antipsychotics. The second generations are more like Zyprexa and Seroquel. These newer medicines are very interesting because they block D2, which settles down norepinephrine and, and dopamine activation. Although, actually, this Vralar does a little bit different. It actually is a partial agonist, not a true blocker. But they also bind at 5-HT1A sites. So that's an interesting concept because now you're taking one medicine that helps with both the problems. That's why they're so popular. They become so popular because it's a single medicine. Because in the past, what you used to have to do is maybe put this person on an anticonvulsant like Depakote or Lamotrigine, make sure they're stable on that, and then introduce something to help them with their depression. Because if you did it too early, of course, you could bump them into a more of a manic state. But this, um, this, this is a problem that also is very much organic or physical and requires medication, requires you to take medication to treat it. Now, 
These patients also, also are in desperate need of cognitive behavioral therapy and talk therapy as well and psychotherapy as well. Because most often what happens is the bipolar illness causes them all kinds of problems in life. You know, like sometimes you see people who they've developed a substance abuse problem because they're basically sort of treating their elevated mood states, right? But once again, these patients right here do not like to take medication. And I'll tell you why. If we think about it, it's one of, it, some of these things don't make a lot of sense. When we talk about substance abuse, it seems like most people with these problems always uh, abuse the most unlikely substance, but with, with bipolar is usually not the case. But if we call this a euthymic mood state, that means a normal mood state. You feel good about life, you feel happy, you're very well mood regulated. And we call this a manic site, a manic episode or a manic uh, uh, a state of being, and we call this a depressed state of being right here. Now remember when I say this, I try to simplify it, but what I really, I, I know that people fall here, 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 all over the place, right? I will, this is 100% true. Everybody who's right here, they all want to get right here. <laughs> There's nobody that likes being, feeling depressed. No, you can't get out of bed, you don't feel good about life. So everybody is looking for this euthymic state right here, right? But what about if you're one of these fellows right this? I, well, I forgot to say this too. For some reason, and I, I can't tell you why, that a lot of patients with bipolar illness seem to be very intelligent. And, and you can look back on people that have been very, very successful in, in the world and had made a very big impact on the world and they suffer from bipolar illness. So these people tend to be very intelligent. And then if you take a fellow like right here who's got bipolar illness and he's sort of right here, he doesn't have to sleep very much. He's got lots of energy. Maybe what he does for a living is that he sells cars. I can guarantee you this fellow right here is going to sell more cars than all the other people combined because he's gregarious, he's outgoing, he's got lots of energy and nothing slows him down. So if you take this fellow right here and you bring him down right here or you make this person, you bring him down to your thymic mood state, a lot of times what they'll do is stop taking their medicine. Why is that? They tell me. They all say the same thing. They go, hey, you know, I was doing good until you put me on that medicine and now I'm depressed. And I say, okay, are you sleeping at night? Yeah, I'm sleeping better than I used to sleep. Um, do you have an appetite? Yeah, I'm eating really good. I'm saying, are you able to get up in the morning and, 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 and get on with your activity? Oh yeah, I can get up in the morning. I say, well, you're not really depressed. You don't have biological markers of depression. But what happened is they're so used to running at this high level and they see themselves as being very productive at that level that when you make them euthymic, they think they're depressed. And so that's why these patients, these individuals, a lot of times stop taking their medicine. And then if they stop taking their medicine and they're not in full remission, and that's, a, that's, a, that's an oxymoron because these patients will not be in remission if they're not taking medicine. But they think that they're doing good, they stop taking their medicine, or they think you made them depressed and they stop taking their medicine. We do have some evidence, although it's... There's uh, some people that dispute this and other people say, yeah, absolutely one person. But they, you may be actually adding to their resistance to, neuro, to neurotransmitter activity. In other words, it might be a lot harder to treat their next manic episode or their next depressed episode with medications because they've developed even more resistance now. And there's a possibility that the medicine that you used before that worked really well, which was like Lamictal, um, is not going to be as effective now, so you might have to try a different medicine. But these, these patients are notorious for stopping their medication. So, all right, let's, take about, let's talk about depression a little bit. We think that uh, depression, my R doesn't look good there, um, is a problem with not enough norepinephrine, not enough serotonin, or not enough of both of those. And remember when I say that, I don't really mean they don't have enough of that molecule. I mean they have possibly, they've become resistant to it. So how much uh, depression do you think is organic or related to the brain? Any guesses? 
You're well off. <laughs> and this is going to be surprising. Remember, we don't have anybody from the ph pharmaceutical companies in here. Um, so we're going to speak reality. If you go back and do a review of the literature, it looks like about 25%. Now, there are exceptions to that um, rule, but we think that depression may about somewhere be about 25% brain-based or related to... Uh, uh, and, and stop and think about this as well, too. A lot of people develop a major depressive episode when they're 40 years old and they had no previous, they didn't have a number of depressive episodes. They had the first depressive episode when they're 25%. Something has happened. You can actually see the changes in the brain if you do a PET scan. Um, by the way, you can see the changes in all these in, in the brains at uh, different areas, and there's lots of debate about what it represents, but. Um, Something I probably should have added here is a traumatic brain injury. And I'm going to put this one as PTSD. There's a very interesting concept here. If you do a PET scan which measures heat or activity or neuronal activity in the brain, um, you can see areas in the amygdala uh, uh, and uh, mood regulation that we normally associate with mood regulation that are, have decreased activity with people who are depressed, you see a very similar pattern in people who have post-traumatic stress disorder. So that concept is important because what it means is that this person didn't have problems in that area of their brain until they had a traumatic event. And um, so this PTSD is actually creating a brain disorder. And that's why SSRIs like Prozac and Zoloft become very, very important because when you give someone with PTSD, if you give them an SSRI, you actually see improvement in that area of the brain associated with depression. But, um, and tra I mentioned here traumatic brain injury as well. You guys have all taken care of traumatic brain injured patients, I'm sure. These patients look like this, but it's atypical. In other words, it doesn't quite have that cyclic pattern. But these people are impulsive, they have agitation, they have problems with anger. Sometimes they look like they have an elevated mood state. And then once again, this is created. We know bipolar runs in families and that there's some genetic defect there. But a traumatic brain injury can create a bipolar illness. It's what we consider an atypical bipolar illness. You know, um, it used to be if you went to war and you had a brain injury, you died on the battlefield. Well, nowadays, you know, everybody who's been in Afghanistan and Iraq and all those places like that, I saw some study one time that said that if someone suffered a traumatic brain injury from a, you know, explosive device on the side of the road, the average time between in the battlefield and getting on a ship that has the best neurosurgeons in the world, about 45 minutes. That's incredible. And so these guys that used to die when they had brain injuries, they're not dying. And right now, we have a tremendous level of traumatic brain injured individuals coming back from these wars, right? And uh, there's lots of studies going on. As a matter of fact, there's some studies at the, BI, the, at the Veterans Administration right now where they're taking these guys and they're putting them on very high doses of anti-inflammatories. In one study, they're using omega-3s, high doses of omega-3s. And the interesting thing is, if they get to them really early and start this anti-inflammatory process, it seems to reduce the incidences of these atypical bipolar-like manifestations. And so, um, but when you look at their brain, they look similar to a brain with someone who has bipolar, but they're a little bit different. Clinically, they look different. And they're much more harder, they're much harder to treat. Um, so anyway, I, I, going back to this, I said 25%. So if we take depression here, and, and we call this depression, there are something biological here. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the DSM, you, to more, or to make a diagnosis of major depression, you have to have biological markers like sleep, appetite, energy, right? Um, but depression is complex. It also involves maybe stuff from the past you never dealt with, maybe stress, you lost your job, COVID happened and you've been stuck in the house. Um, and uh, here's a big one. 
Remember where I said before that we used to miss all the bipolar type 2s because they never went to the doctor when they were feeling elevated mood state or had a good mood state. They only went they're depressed. Well, we used to miss all these people with trauma and how much it contributes to depression. And I just said, you know, PTSD, if you look at someone who has a diagnosis of PTSD and they have trauma, their brain looks very much like a person who's depressed. It's very similar in the areas of depression. But the reality is that all these things come together to make a major depressive episode. Um, and so really, if you're a clinician, if you know that the biological problem here is about this much, then you know that you're not going to be able to give someone Prozac and they're going to get on with their life and feel great. Your goal should be to improve these things with the medicine so that you can do the work on these things. So there's my take home message with major depression, either first episode or recurrent, is that if you do not do talk therapy or some form of, of, of cognitive behavioral therapy or so forth um, with depression, then you most likely won't get better. You may get some improvement in these biological markers, um, but the goal should be that make these improve so that you can do the work you need to do. And if you don't believe me, there was a study done by a pharmaceutical company Actually, this pharmaceutical company didn't uh, do the study themselves. They hired somebody to do the study. But I, I don't want to talk bad about pharmaceutical companies today. But sometimes I can't. Pharmaceutical companies are very smart. And they're in the business to make a profit, right? Remember, when Eli Lilly took serotonin. When Eli Lilly took Prozac and its effect on serotonin to market, I mean, to basically to the FDA, say, look, this is a new medicine that's going to improve serotonin. It's going to help with people's depression. They, they spent like four and a half million dollars of research to prove that. That was over 30 years ago. I don't know what it costs now, but they put a lot of money into these studies and they expect to get some back. Well, one of the things that pharmaceutical companies will do is that they, um, they look for ways to get you know, to capitalize on their, um, their making their profit. And so, for example, sometimes you can take a medicine that is old and you can uh, change it so that it's like a reverse isomer of the medicine and it will usually be much more effective. Like, for example, we used to have citalopram or Celexa. And if you reverse that isomer, it becomes escitalopram or Lexapro, right? And it's more effective. Well, this particular company, their medicine was going to become generic and they were going to lose their profit so they did a study on a reverse isomer of that medication. Oh, by the way, another example I like to talk about is that a long, long time ago, we figured out that um, uh, women who had premenstrual dysphoric syndrome, where they would only get moody and depressed about, you know, after day 14, 15 of their cycle, we figured out that you could give them Prozac in a lower dose, 10 milligrams, on day 14, and they take it to their period stops, and you would get rid of that emotional dysregularity, that, that emotional upheaval. And, but the problem was, when Prozac came out, it only came out as 20 milligrams. And 20 milligrams was too much, they didn't need that much. So I used to always tell people, just open up the capsule and pour half of it onto your applesauce in the morning, and you'll be good to go, right? Well, when Eli Lilly found out that primary care people were using 10 milligrams of Prozac to treat premenstrual dysphoric syndrome, they put a new medicine out. They call it Sarah Fem for feminine. They put it in a birth control pack, uh, pack with like pretty flowers. And I can't remember now, but it was well over a couple of dollars per tablet. So, you know, and, and it's not, I'm not saying, well, they're, they're terrible, but they're, they're looking to make, capitalize on that market. So they did this study on this reverse isomer. They put these people on this medicine, right? And then at eight months, they looked at the uh, difference in terms of remission, where they were no longer scoring on their Beck inventory of depression. And you know what the results were on this new medicine after eight months, I think it was? Um, it was like, it was somewhere between 20 and 30 percent uh, uh, reported in, uh, uh, freedom from depression by this Beck inventory. So this is very dismal <laughs> because there's a lot of people that believe that if you have a first major depressive episode, first episode of depression in your life, and you were able to sit in a corner for eight months, anywhere between 30, 20 to 30 percent would get better spontaneously, spontaneous remission. And of course, no one can test that out because if you put someone in a corner for, you know, eight months with major depression, they'll commit suicide and they lose their families and of course all the things. But they believe that based on anecdotal evidence that 
there is spo spontaneous remission rate. So this pharmaceutical company said, oh my goodness, our medicine's not any better than uh, spontaneous remission. What are we going to do? And the people that are doing the study, were, they're very wise. They said, no, 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 we're not publishing that. In fact, it's very, very hard to find that, those first results. They did another study where they put the people on medicine, and then they put the people on just cognitive behavior therapy for eight months, and then they put people on cognitive behavior therapy plus the medicine. You guys know what happened. I can't remember exactly where it was, but it was you know somewhere above 90% or 88% or 90%. In other words, medicine plus therapy is what brings you to remission. And that's very important with depression. Now, I mentioned there's always exclusions to this or exemptions for the. There is one type of depression that we refer to as psychotic depression. And sometimes it used to be referred to as melancholic depression. We don't really fully understand that depression. I've seen maybe a couple cases in my life. One time I saw, I saw an individual and this patient, this individual, was a, a CEO of a large airline company. Very, very successful, and he was 54 years old. When I met that individual, he was so psychotic that he was tearing the cabinets off the wall, he was barking, he was agitated, he was completely, floridly psychotic. And I remember the psychiatrist saw him and said, well, he's bipolar manic. He's having a psychotic manic episode. But he had no family history of bipolar illness, and he had no previous episodes of mood dysregulation, right? And so some people, then another person said, well, he's just a schizophrenic that got missed. No schizophrenics get missed by the time they're 54 years of age. So that, what he had was that very unusual depression that is almost probably 100% brain related. And they look like this. And the interesting thing here is that it probably has to do with the serotonin site 5-HT2A. And a lot of times now what we're doing with people with psychosis is we're actually trying to block that site instead of improving it. We want to improve 5-HT1A and block 5-HT2A. So it's kind of complicated. But um, you know what the treatment of choice is for that type of organic brain disease? Can anybody guess? It's the pink elephant that no one will talk about. It's called electroconvulsive therapy. Yeah. And uh, as a matter of fact, he had, after failed trials on multiple medications, he had multi-monitored ECT, which was unilateral, and he had uh, 14 treatments in three sessions, I think. And uh, he was back to like I'm talking right now. It was almost miraculous. And, uh, but, but actually nobody actually uses ECT anymore as the treatment of choice. Even though they know it's probably the gold standard for that type of depression, they don't use it as a treatment of choice because they're worried about getting sued. They're worried about someone saying some complications from the ECT. And come, you know, ECT, the way it used to be, you tied somebody down and you gave them a big shock right across their brain. You know, <laughs> They'd lose their memory. Sometimes they have problems with their speech. They get actually break their bones from muscle contractions. Now, of course, they can do like unilateral ECT one side to preserve the uh, speech in the memory areas. And um, you can do multi-monitored, and you're under, you're under uh, Bravitol and succinylcholine so that you don't even see the seizure, you only see it on activity. But for that type of depression, because it's all organic, and organic uh, intervention seems to be very, very effective. You know what happens in ECT, and nobody really talks about this, but when someone is ECT, now this is only true with an induced seizure, not a natural seizure. But with an induced seizure, all the neurotransmitter, all the channels open up. And all the neurotransmitters, all of them, all those ones I do another, they flood the brain. But something else interesting happens. Somehow that electrical activity resets the neurons so that now they're sensitive to the neurotransmitters again. You know how when you got a computer locked up, and what do you do? You reset it, and now all of a sudden it's working good, the memory's working good. Seems to be that same thing occurs with ECT and these people that have this type of depression. Is all of a sudden now, remember I talked earlier about probably most of these problems are resistance, not really a lack of having that neurotransmitter. It's the resistance to the neurotransmitters. Well, now they have no resistance to neurotransmitters and they feel on top of the world. But there is an interesting drawback is that it seems like in a lot of these patients, it's not sustained. And nobody really knows why, but there are people that have this type of depression. They'll get ECT treatment once a year, so they never get psychotic again. 
So it's kind of interesting. And we don't know why it's not a sustained effect. Nobody fully understands it. But that particular type of depression is 100% related to the brain. But that's, a, that's an a, anomaly. That's not the, the typical type of uh, depression. So let's, um, let's talk about anxiety. This is going to be an important one. Um, how much of anxiety is brain-based? I want to say 50-50. You know, you're always saying 50-50. How much? 15. Uh, Okay, well, I, really that was a misleading question because we don't know. <laughs> Nobody really knows. Um, uh, anxiety, uh, we're not really sure how much is related to the brain. However, um, and there's some, a lot of studies out there. You guys have heard of generalized anxiety disorder, right? Okay, so generalized anxiety disorder has to do... Anxiety has to do with not enough GABA in the brain. You know, a long, long time ago, I was climbing on Mount Rainier, and I was wearing clothes like this, and I slipped and I fell in a puddle of water, 